Hi, uh, I'm Praveena. So uh, Angelica has already given me an introduction. Uh, so I'll just go ahead with the slide deck. Cool. Um, before, um, so today is today's talk is about interpreting relational uh, databases into Neo4j and how you may go about doing that. Um, but before uh, I could show you how you do that, um, I would like to start with the motivation behind uh, the project and generally uh, Neo4j um, as a whole. Um, so I every time I go and talk about this, uh, I'm these are some of the common questions I answer over and over again. So I thought it will be a good way to structure this talk in that format. Um, so let's begin with uh, why would you want to choose Neo4j over relational database? If you think about um, traditional databases, you want to store data to look up and use it later in any application. So that's that's basically why you want a database. Um, and if you think about traditional uh, databases, I mean, what what you would, uh, how you would store it in in, uh, in a relational database like MySQL or Microsoft Server or something like that is, you would organize data in tables and relationships, but and uh, the relationships between the data would be modeled using primary keys uh, or you link them using foreign keys, and uh, you also place constraints on top of the data to ensure uh, for data integrity um, and like just general sanitization as, as a whole. And uh, you basically do the lookup uh, through that. So you have the data in your tables and the relationship between the data is modeled through the keys. Uh, in general, if you are, uh, if you're designing something like a person, if you want to depict a person belongs to department's relationship, this is a classic thing you would do day in and day out in any software application that you build. You will have a person's table and you would have a department's table. So a person in this case is Alice and then uh, there are three departments available for us. And Alice belongs to um, all three departments. So you would have a department members join table in between persons and uh, department. And you would link uh, the primary keys of the persons table, in this case, Alice's primary key with the department's uh, primary key for for future PO815 and A42. So you link that in the department members join table. Um, so in, in a sense, this is how you model your person belongs to department's relationship. This is just the relevant data projected. And if you were to do the same thing over in Neo4j, you would simply have the person's node and Alice's node, and you would have the four future P0815 and A42 nodes on the other side, and you link the data between these two nodes using the relationship. And by doing this, what you have done is you have essentially removed the join table in itself. You can now ask, well, along with um, along with the, the join table just didn't provide that. I can add extra data onto the join table in the previous case. Uh, in Neo4j, it is right now, uh, I mean, it is possible to add your properties to the belongs to relationship between Alice and for future. You could say that uh, she started in this department on a certain date as a property on the relationship. So for all practical purposes, your relationships are treated as first class objects in Neo4j, just as how nodes are uh, treated as well. Um, so this is a side by side comparison of the same data represented in relational database versus graph database. So when we started with saying why Neo4j over uh, any relational database, this is a classic example of why you want to do this, where if you want to treat, treat your relationships as first class objects, which is what you would always use in lookups apart from using the primary keys, you want to find interconnected data. This is one reason why you would want to choose Neo4j over a traditional relational database, because it completely removes the um, necessity for a join table. And you can directly link data and like you can modify it. You can modify relationships as you go by. You can add new intermediate nodes uh, between, uh, you know, to, to hold extra data in a relationship as well. Um, the second reason is uh, Neo4j is whiteboard friendly. <clears throat> uh, what I mean by that is um, when you try and um, when you try and pictureize a solution, what you would usually do is you would um, draw 
your problem on on a whiteboard and you will try and trans you you communicate it to your co-developers your your team and then you try and provide the solution through your application so there is some level of translation that happens between what's there in the whiteboard to your application and this is covered um, uh, uh, in this excellent talk uh, called mastering data modeling uh, where the where he, he speaks about uh, three different models the conceptual model the logical model and the physical model um, essentially um, what um, what he what Joe McGuire talks about in is your conceptual model has all the entities attributes and relationships uh, that you would use to identify on a whiteboard so if you're drawing Alice belongs to a department uh, you you call Alice as a person and Alice Alice by itself like you can use that as a key and the department names and the relationship which is department members table that you're coming up with at the end the the relationship belongs to is um, is is in itself what you would call a conceptual model and then that gets translated when you do it in a relational database you would say okay Alice is in Alice is a person and I need a person table and I need the name, the age column in, in the person table. And similarly for the department, you would need like a department table and there is a name and then you have like the department head or whatever information you have. And then you translate the relationship between them using the foreign keys. So that's how your conceptual model is translated into your logical model. And then comes a physical model, which is how the data is stored in disk in itself, which has like indexes, table spaces, and all of these other things that you would use. Um, and what uh, Joe says is that like um, he he notices how there is a distortion when you translate uh, data from from your conceptual model to your logical and physical model. And essentially what happens is like you you sort of like merge the two models and uh, you end up with uh, where the conceptual and the logical model gets merged and you basically even when you try and draw in in the whiteboard diagram you you, you tend to think about it that way in in neo4j we your your logical model is essential is essentially what your conceptual model is as well so when you draw something on whiteboard which in this case it will be like um, alice belongs to uh, for futures department you would just draw two nodes and you link between those you don't think about it in terms of having oh now i need to translate it into a join table in between you just basically save the data as whatever is there in the whiteboard um which is which is very easy for um someone um to modify and and it removes the cognitive um what do you call it? Um, what's the word? Sorry, it removes the cognitive overload um, when, when you try and do that. Um, so an example of this is uh, Pravina works at Neo4j. And if I were to model this in whiteboard, this is how I would do it. And in Neo4j, it, it translates to the exact same thing. Um, the next question is, uh, how, how would you? So now Neo4j, I've learned what Neo4j is, and I, I know why it is. Mar I know why it is better than a relational database. Then how, if Neo4j is new to you, the next natural question is like, how do you model in Neo4j? Um, if you're used to um, my uh, like a relational database like MySQL, you might recognize um, an ER diagram. So this is basically an ER diagram that I have where a person uh, lives at a certain address. And so you, a person has an ID, username, and address ID, and, and the address has an ID and a postcode. And in MySQL, you would have a um, foreign key uh, join here, where you have the ID of the address linked into the address ID in the person table. In Neo4j, you don't need to do that. You just draw a relationship between the two. So the person and the address has just the address ID relationship between them. Uh, uh, another classic case is like having a joint table sna scenario, a many-to-many -many relationship, which is you have a lot of students in the student table and you have a lot of courses in the courses table and student take courses. So how would you model that in Neo4j? That is, again, plain and simple. Um, in Neo4j, you would just go ahead and link the student with the course. So many students can, link, can be linked to the same course and the student can then be linked to... Um, 
um, to, uh, to the course as well. Uh, whereas in MySQL, you would have the course and student table and the join table in between where you have the student ID and the course ID as foreign keys. And it also has the credits information on it, which in case as a, uh, which in case of Neo4j, you can actually have properties on the student course relationship. So you can add credits uh, for every student course relationship as well. Uh, this is a slightly um, a different scenario where you have an order orders table in the middle in MySQL, and it gives you um, all information that you need uh, regarding a particular order, which customer it belongs to, which employee ordered it, which shipper, and what are the order details that you might uh, need. This exact thing is modeled in Neo4j. It's very, very similar to what MySQL does. Uh, you just basically have an intermediate node order which links between all these four other entities in, in, in the whiteboard. So uh, one of the things that um, we, we talk about is Neo for, how Neo4j is schema optional, um, which is like, in, in, in a lot of sense, having a uh, specific order helps us to make sense of the world around us. Like, you know, like having a recipe to bake a cake or um, if you're like me, um, when I first arrived in London, like understanding the tube map to figure out your way around London um, and all of these things. So um, so having having something, a sort of a map or, you know, like a guideline to follow uh, help, helps us understand complex structures. And in many cases, uh, explaining our application and what it does and how it is modeled in the database is useful um, when, when new people join or even when understanding your own problems as well. So um, when we say Neo4j is schema optional, uh, what we mean is that you you it gives you all the abilities for, key, uh, for schema in terms of categorizing your data to nodes, labels, properties, and relationships. And so you can, you, you have the full potential of uh, what you need in a schema. At the same time, it also, uh, helps you to change data as you go by, as your solution develops, and uh, as you see, you know when your model uh, when your model is expanding, you can you can change your data accordingly. So, um, in 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 a relational database, a pass, but is it possible for a person uh, to also be an employee? Uh, yes, it is, but you will have to add migration scripts and uh, have a tagging mechanism or something like that to do that. Whereas in Neo4j, uh, uh, a node that is uh, a, a node can have multiple labels, so Alice can be a person and also an employee, and it lets you model that relationship really, really easily. So you have the you have all the abilities to search using your schema, which is like you can search using a, a certain node label at the same time. At the same time, you also have um, the option not to as well. Um, so if you are excited about Neo4j and uh, you want to start off somewhere and you're thinking a uh, best way to look at it is I have this relational database with me and I want to see how it would look like if I were to do this in uh, Neo4j. Enter Neo4j ETL2. Ta-da! So your Neo4j ETL2 is our in-house tool written in Java with the uh, and it runs on top of JDBC uh, drivers. So it, it uses all the cataloging and all the schema capabilities of JDBC drivers provided by other databases themselves to interpolate the schema and understand how the data is structured in schema. And it uses a set of three simple rules to figure out how it is best to um, represent the same schema in Neo4j. Uh, now, this is uh, an, an, uh, a one-step import. So you need to, so this is just one way to get your data into Neo4j. And this might not be the optimum one. Uh, there are multiple other ways for you to go ahead and look at this data and clean up uh, later, which I will browse through at the end of the end of the slides, but uh, it will give you a very good starting point to go ahead and explore Neo4j and run your queries and um, yeah, just use use all the resources that is available on top of Neo4j to, to run it. Um, so this is, I'm doing, I'm going to do this on a classic relational database. So all, uh, so this is, I, I'm, I'm sure you must be familiar with the Northman database. 
So it's, it's just a regular Northwind database that I have on my MySQL instance. It has employees, customers, orders, territories, regions, all of these things. And I'm going to try and import it using my Neo4j ETL tool. Uh, and this uh, ER diagram, of which represents the MySQL da uh, database, would be translated to this data model in Neo4j. And we will see how that is done. I'll go, I'll go through the rules uh, as well. So the first thing that we would do is configure the connection. So um, you can configure connection to any any database which has a published JDBC driver, which which has like a schema interpolation support. Um, so that there, there are like so currently our ETL tool supports Microsoft Server, MySQL, Postgres, and many more. I haven't added all of these things here. Uh, and then you would map your uh, you select the database and then you try and map that into a mapping file and understand how, how may i interpret this relational database into nodes and the relationships between them because ultimately that's what we want to do we want to import nodes and uh, the data and tables as nodes and the relationships between the tables as uh, relationships and the, and then you have the ability to edit uh, a mapping file and then you once you have if you don't want to edit the mapping file that's fine as well you you can just go ahead and import your data into neo4j now you can import the data into neo4j through multiple tools one is using the neo4j import tool itself so currently if you have um, a set of uh, csvs which which you know already exists like you know you have already done the work of separating into nodes and relationships, you can just go ahead and import it using Neo4j import tool, which is provided along with Neo4j. Um, but if you if you don't have that, you can you can use the Neo4j ETL tool where you can configure the connection and then you can import. So let's go ahead and do the demo. Uh, I'm going to use this. Okay, so this is the database that I'm using. Uh, this is my Neo4j instance that I'm going to import the data into from my MySQL database. Match of n return n is a way of selecting all the data in your data in your Neo4j instance. And currently it says uh, no changes and no records. Let me maximize this. Yeah, uh, so currently it says no changes and no records. So that's uh, evidence to you all that I'm actually not, um, you know, cheating in, in any, any way or form. So I'm going to go ahead, stop this database before I import. So I have done this and stop the database. And let's go ahead and look at how we may import the database. So I have already defined uh, my JDBC connection to, um, to my MySQL instance. So uh, just to show you, um, this, when I select MySQL, it, it loads it with some defaults here. And I've already defined my uh, test connection uh, in, in before before this demo. So I'm just so what if, if you're starting with the ETL tool newly, you just have to go ahead and give this connection details here, and uh, you can go ahead and directly import the test data. So I'm I have already specified my test connection as that. I want to import it into my database. So the first step to do that, as we discovered earlier, is let me go back to the slides so that it's easy. So I have configured the connection. Next, I'm going to start with the mapping. So I'm going here and I'm saying start mapping. So what it is doing here right now is um, it's generating the mapping file for me. So the mapping file is really simple. It says that um, I have a node here, the graph of this in the Northwind schema, the employees table is going to be imported as a node and it's giving a select query uh, through which it will select all the data from the employee table in the Northwind database in MySQL. Uh, and it is going to put it in my, uh, this database instance as a node. Um, so this, this is basically what the mappings file is. It's a JSON which contains a list of select queries and uh, it tells you which tables belong where in, in the Neo4j schema that we are going to have. So I've done the mapping and the mapping is successful. 
and I'm selecting which database I wanted to import it into. So this is the same database that I showed you earlier, which I had stopped. And I'm selecting this database and I'm saying next. So I agree that this isn't the best of, uh, you know, representation of what the schema looks like. But basically what it shows is I'm just moving this across so that it's, it's evident as to what this one does. So it says that territory and region are connected using the region um, relationship and employee has a self-referential employees relationship there. And we also saw that the order uh, has a uh, link to shipper, customers, product and employees. Um, at this stage, you can change your metadata as however you want, but for the sake of the demo and uh, do not complicate things further. I mean, it's not really complicated, but I just want to get with the demo and then show you other bits, in interesting bits. I'm not going to change anything in the mapping table, but this is the place if you want to change, you could change it into Neo4j. And if you have a look at this, it says the SQL type is an integer and well, it's importing into Neo4j type, it's going to import it as a long. So it, it, it shows you what it is mapping each of the data type from the MySQL server into this. And this is what your uh, schema would look like at the end. And I'm saying save your mapping file here and I click on next and at this point I'm there are multiple options for me to import and I'm going to select Neo4j import because I want that's the quickest way to do it so I'm saying okay go ahead uh, my connection name was not a uh, test and it is importing from the database Northwind uh, from MySQL into my local Neo4j instance this uh, where the status is stopped and I'm importing the data here uh, so what this is doing is it's using the SQL file to generate CSVs um, and it uses the Neo4j import tool later um, to use those CSVs to, uh, to import data into Neo4j. So we saw that it's reading the metadata from the mapping file that we generated earlier and it is exporting uh, from RDBMS to CSV file. So that's the first step. It's, uh, it's generating all the data headers and things like that. And then it is creating the Neo4j store from the CSV. And I'm saying import data. So the data import is done. And I'm going to go to my database. So this is the database that I had stopped earlier. I'm going to start it again. I click on start. Oh, it says starting. OK, and I'm going to open the browser. And I can go ahead and say call db.schema. So this is a handy way for us to have a look at the schema that it has generated. And as you can see that this has actually generated the schema that was shown in the initial import data. It even has a self-referential employee. This thing, it has the product, the order, and the region. Um, I don't want to um, return all data but i can show you i'll just limit to 100 or something uh, oh sorry that's right so you can see that it has imported this data inside neo4j in earlier case when i was doing match of and return in which is the select all query it was returning no data at all but in this case it has actually imported so that brings the end of the demo let's go back to the slides oh actually um so yeah, so first step, what we did was configure the connection. Second was no start mapping. And then we made edits if required and we saved the mapping file. Uh, and then we selected the import that we wanted to do and the import was completed successfully. Um, this is the uh, components diagram for the ETL2. So what, we, what it basically did was from MySQL uh, server, we use the JDBC driver to, do, to write a schema crawler, which, which interprets the schema to tables, joins, and join tables. I'll go over the rules shortly after this. And it wrote a mappings file. So at this point, it gives you a way to edit the mappings file if required. And then it uses the mappings uh, JS, uh, JSON file to extract the data into CSV, and it writes it into nodes and relationship CSVs. 
and your import tool uh, we use the neo4j import tool to then use this new uh, use this nodes and csvs use the neo4j import tool and import it into neo4j uh, now let's have a look at what happens in the how how what are the rules that we use to interpret the schema here so the first rule is a table with a foreign key is treated as a join table and it's imported as a node with a relationship to something else so this is what uh, we saw earlier which is the person and the address uh, two different tables and it was related to each other using the foreign key between uh, foreign key address id um, and this gets imported as a person and address id the second one is a table that has two foreign keys and uh, is get it gets imported as a join table and it's imported as a relationship between those uh, the third final one is uh, the idea of having an intermediate node where we have uh, the order, which was basically it, it had links to all other nodes in, in I mean, not all other, but like um, four other nodes in, in our tables, in our schema. So we, we are just going to go ahead and import that as an intermediate node with relationships to order ID, employee, shipper, and customer information. And this gets returned into the mappings file where you have a select statement to select from the MySQL database, which gets import, uh, which gets imported as a node in this case uh, into the Neo4j database. Um, and once, uh, and and then we use the and and then we use the select statements to write the CSV files using our CSV exporter, and use Neo4j import to import using the CSVs directly. So this is uh, this is what I was saying earlier, which is if you have a CSV file already existing, you don't even need the ETL tool. You can just go ahead and import it directly into Neo4j. If there is a way, if you already have the nodes and relationships mapped out, this is possible for you to do so. Um, and once the data is migrated into Neo4j, this is what you would see. Like This is my uh, test database, which I had with very limited number of nodes. And this is what, when I run match up and return in, this is, the, this is how the migrated database looks like. Uh, the tools used in Neo4j uh, ETL tool is, you, we use the JDBC drivers provided by, uh, provided by the database themselves. We have Schema Crawler, which is an open source um, product. And we also use Neo4j import uh, to import the database. You can also use Cypher shell or Neo4j shell or plain Cypher to export data into uh, Neo4j. Neo4j ETL tool is designed for extension, which is once you have the mappings file, if you want to go ahead and do something else with it, you know, maybe have other data representation or you want to like write a D3.js uh, visualization or something like that, you will be able to do that because there is a way to just generate the mappings file and leave it as is using the command line. Or you can just copy paste the text from the from the tool once it generates it. And again, similarly, like this, you if you have the nodes and CSVs, you can directly import using Neo4j import. Or if you just, all you needed was just the nodes and relationship CSV, you can stop at that level as well. Um, apart from Neo4j ETL tool, we have a bunch of other ways that you can get data into Neo4j. So you can use load CSV, APOC procedures, uh, Neo4j import, and Neo4j admin for you to import your data. Um, in conclusion, I hope that you, I have, I've convinced you that um, the way the way the world works is using predefined structures, and we have to make sense of the predefined structures because yes. They help us in understanding complex environments and complex problems. But at the same time, we need to leave room for um, for extension whenever we see anomalies. And that's what that's what makes the data around us and the world around us beautiful. And I hope you choose a database which reflects that as well. And in, in this case, Neo4j is the database for you to do that. It helps you to adapt predefined structures and rules and yet be forgiving when rules don't apply and neo4j etl tool is just one way for you to get the data into neo4j so it's it pushes you one step closer to trying neo4j if you haven't tried before um, go ahead uh, give neo4j um, a spin you can download neo4j from there we have both a community and an enterprise edition uh, you can choose one which suits your needs um, it's an open source product 
and here are some links uh, that I uh, that I was talking about and I'm sure Anshlika would send you uh, better like the slides and the email in a, in a, better, in a better deck. Uh, that's me. That's my Twitter handle. So um, go ahead and tweet questions at me or at me for j or in the go to webinar. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Praveena. That was awesome. Um, we have a couple minutes left for questions. So if you do have any questions, please post them in the uh, questions chat box of your GoToWebinar control panel, and I'll read a few out. So um, the data size that you imported, can you elaborate a little bit on what was the size of the data that you did in the demo? And then are there really any limits around data size that you can import into Neo4j? Um, so I have tested the data with the Neo4j ETL tool with 50 GB of data before. Uh, which was for the music brains uh, data set and it it took it did take around 30 or 35 minutes for it to finish importing just because the it had multiple uh, schemas and you know things to look at and interpret the data so that that gives you an idea of what um, what the data set we are looking at but better if you have try importing your data and if you have any trouble just speak to us in the Neo4j user Slack, and I'm sure we'll be able to help you out to get the data into Neo4j because our field team does much more than this. So we will find a way for you to work this if Neo4j ETL tool doesn't work out for you. Okay, and I'll send out a link to the Neo4j uh, Slack if you're not already on it. Um, so another question, what, so you mentioned a couple of different methods to import data into Neo4j. Um, can you talk a little bit about which ones are beneficial in what situations or which method would be the fastest? Mm. So um, so we, we have Neo4j import is the best way to import da data into Neo4j because it's been optimized for a lot of scenar scenarios. Uh, having said that, uh, if you have your um, CSVs already available, like for instance, many times when we run our meetup, we use the meetup APIs to import data from meetup directly into, into Neo4j. And that time we give limits to import it, you know, every 10,000 records or something like that. So there are different ways you can optimize each of the import mechanisms. You just have to find one that suits the scenario that you want to import it really. Um, yeah, like, I mean, as I said, if uh, try one and if it doesn't work, just ask in the user Slack. I'm sure someone will be able to reply. Okay, um, and I'm sure this rings true for a lot of people, but if you're working for a, a team that's still using SQL databases and you want to use Neo4j, is it easy to schedule a daily ETL import uh, for that data into Neo4j? Or what would you recommend? Yeah, so the 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 problem that um, that the ETL tool that we are still trying to fix is actually provide a functionality to do that, because um, when you this is a one ETL tool currently works as a one time only import. Um, so if you it doesn't figure out deltas, for instance, between the last import to between yesterday's import to today's import. So we are trying to figure out how to do that. And it is it is a bit complex than what we expected it to be, but it's definitely there in our uh, timeline of things to fix, to provide the ability to do that because we, we have heard a lot of our customers want that kind of functionality. Okay. Um, and there are a couple of questions around importing the data and the storage involved. So. Uh, there seems to be a CSV involved uh, in, in most of these imports. So how would that work with a really large database? And where do those CSVs get stored when in transit? Is that local or is it distributed? Interesting. So um, the Neo4j ETL, the CSVs that you generate gets stored uh, from wherever you are running the command. So yes, you will have to provide it um, enough storage space for you to do that. But if you have large amounts of data, then you should be, I mean, there are other ways to get that data into Neo4j. Um, you can, for instance, use um, 
you know, like a data dumper, like using the Neo4j import tool directly will be will be the best place to do that. Um, I, I'm actually not uh, really sure about what happens when you have like a terabyte of data or something like that. The field team might be best suited to answer that. Um, okay. I'm... Oh, someone asked a question about like what, um, whether Neo4j can handle big amounts of data in real time. So uh, Panama Papers is one of the you know biggest data dump that was available and like researchers used uh, that data dump to to find out so many things about like you know offshore shell companies and things like that and neo4j database was was the database used in in panama papers so if you have if you have data which is really big in size it's it's of no it's of no issue for us we can support big data sizes as well okay um, and is there a general recommended way to store attributes and nodes and relationships uh, we've seen a couple different ways of doing it, either in a separate relational database using the node ID or the relationship ID as a key, um, or is it a better idea to keep the graph database slim, especially for larger graphs? So in Neo4j, um, you don't, we don't actually use the node IDs. We don't do lookup based on the node IDs or relationship IDs. I mean, you can do lookup based on however you want, but uh, Neo4j, I mean, like every other database, you can add indexes on like, you know, the names and things like that. But how the relationship is linked between two nodes is, is not visible. You don't have to worry about it because the database takes care of uh, that. It hides that implementation detail from the users. Um, okay, makes sense. And can you use the initial MySQL where statements uh, to only use some data from the original database, for example, as records created in the past X years? Uh, yeah, so that if so, what you could do if you want to do that is go and edit the mappings JSON file, where you can say in MySQL select so and so thing where blah blah blah, and just use that to select that specific data. Um, but remember, if you're using where like on audit data, make sure that you're using that same where matching clause for all your table data as well, because what you don't want is having some nodes imported and some nodes not imported. Okay, um, and you talked a little bit about large data sets uh, using the Panama Papers as an example. I don't think that we know the exact amount of time that it would take, but um, when you're dealing with a database of that size or a data set of that size, how long would you estimate a, a query to take? Um, this person is saying that they're they're noticing very long query times when analyzing other similar databases. Um, actually, um, I don't know the I, I I can't seem to find an answer from the top of my head. But I will suggest that there is a so in Neo4j we have sandbox environments uh, loaded with preset data. Is Panama Papers available it as is, well? Yeah. So if you go to uh, is it sandbox dot at neo4j.com backslash sandbox. Yeah, so if you go there, you can get your own Panama Papers Neo4j instance and go ahead and like play with it and you can find it out yourselves. 